I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel removes its metal detectors from the Temple Mount. The Israeli guard injured in a Jordanian attack returns to Israel. And we'll reveal which up-and-coming NBA star is going to be joining an Israeli basketball team. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. In a conciliatory move, Israel has removed the metal detectors it had placed on the Temple Mount following a shooting attack on the site that left two Israeli police officers dead. Now, the detectors are being replaced with so-called smart, less obtrusive security measures. Israel began removing the detectors along with security cameras overnight on Tuesday following an Israeli security cabinet decision to replace the barriers with more advanced technology. The government will reportedly be allocating around 100 million shekels over the next six months towards a set of more advanced cameras that can detect hidden objects at the site. Muslim officials claim the metal detectors and older security cameras were fully dismantled by dawn. The security measures were set up by Israel following a tragic terror attack at the Temple Mount when three Arab Israeli assailants killed two Israeli officers with guns that they had stashed at the holy site prior to the attack. In a rare move, Israel then responded by briefly closing up the site to implement metal detectors. You go to a holy site, it can be in the Vatican in Rome or in Mecca. In some places you have to go through metal detectors, some places you are being inspected. And unfortunately, those terrorists took advantage of uh, the situation. And we will make sure that Muslims will be able to pray on the Temple Mount. But at the same time, we don't want to see another incident when people are bringing explosives or weapons to this holy place. Well, those very detectors have caused an uproar across the Middle East, setting off Palestinian riots, with many Muslims claiming the move is an Israeli attempt to assert greater control over the holy site. We want all obstacles put in place to uh, deprive worshippers of exercising their right to go and pray. And all these things, including... Um, uh, metal detectors, cameras, obstacles, all of them, they need to be removed and removed uh, completely without conditions. For those who want to maintain the status quo, it means the removal of all these things that, rem that violate the status quo. Don't expect all Palestinians to be angels not to react to it. Even some might take the issue in their hand as individuals. That is not necessarily the policy of the Palestinian government or the leadership of the Palestine Liberation Organization or the State of Palestine. Five Palestinians have been killed in violent clashes between rioters and police over the weekend, and another three Israelis have been brutally murdered in a terror attack in the Jewish settlement of Khalamish. In Jordan, an Israeli security guard was stabbed in the Jordanian embassy following the tensions. The Israeli decision to remove the metal detectors apparently came after Jordan promised to safely deliver the guard back to Israel if the Israeli government were to remove the metal detectors on the Temple Mount. Hundreds of Palestinians gathered to celebrate in Jerusalem last night following the announcement that the detectors were going to be removed and are calling for the Jordanian Waqf to make the next move. <laughs> الشرعية الأوقاف والشعب القدس الشعب اللي بقرر الشعب والأوقاف إذا الأوقاف قولهم امشوا بمشوا والملك معهم الملك عبد الله Yet Muslim leaders are still advising worshippers to stay away from the Temple Mount even after Israel's security barriers and cameras have been removed. The Waqf Islamic Trust is encouraging Muslims to continue boycotting the holy site until there's a review of the new Israeli security arrangements made there. The United Nations Middle East envoy is now putting his two cents into the whole Temple Mount controversy, and it's no surprise that his comments are ticking off Israel. 
Even though Israel has already removed the metal detectors, the UN's Nikolai Mladenov is still warning that the crisis on the Temple Mount could get a lot bigger. I think the dangers on the ground will escalate um, if we go through another cycle of Friday prayer without a resolution to this, uh, to this uh, current crisis. Nobody should be mistaken that these events are localized events. In fact, they may be taking place over a couple of hundred square meters, but they affect millions, if not billions, of people around the world. They have the potential to have catastrophic costs well beyond the walls of the old city, well beyond Israel and Palestine, well beyond the Middle East itself. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations says a script is being flipped on Israel, claiming that the whole incident began when two Israeli police officers were killed in a terror attack on the Temple Mount by assailants that had been storing their guns at the holy site. Instead of condemning this act of terror, calming the situation and pledging to remove all fanatics from their society, the Palestinians are spreading the most horrible lies. They would like the international community to believe that this unspeakable act of violence is Israel's fault. Don't believe the phony Palestinian outrage. The Security Council is meeting to discuss how to de-escalate the conflict. Let me save them some time. It's quite simple. Demand that Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority Stop promoting violence. Tell them to stop educating to hate. Make them stop paying terrorists. The Temple Mount is the holiest site in Judaism and the third holiest in Islam. In 1967, Israel won the Six-Day War and gained control of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. But to keep the peace with Jordan, Israel allowed the Jordanian Waqf to retain authority over the holy site. Today, under the status quo, only Muslims can pray at the Temple Mount. Jews can visit the site but are not allowed to perform any Jewish rituals there. The Israeli guard that was wounded in an attack on the Israeli embassy compound in Jordan on Sunday has now returned to Israel along with the rest of the embassy's staff. ILTV's Aaron Porras joins us with the details. Now, Aaron, given the big upset, how is Israel able to coordinate with Jordan to allow a smooth exit for this guard? Well, it's, it's interesting, actually, because according to Channel 2 News, the report is that the Hashemite Kingdom demanded that Israel resolve the, the situation on the Temple Mount and remove metal detectors, uh, or they would not ensure safe passage of, this, of the embassy staff and the guard back to the Israeli border. Right, but Israel is also denying that that's what took place. They're denying that that's what took place, and yet the metal detectors are gone. So it's, it, it could be a coincidence, or there might be some meat to that. The guard made it over the Israeli-Jordanian border through the Allenby crossing last night with the rest of the staff from Israel's embassy in Amman. The whole group was led by Ambassador Enat Schlein with close cooperation between Israeli and Jordanian security. The Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu called to welcome back both the ambassador and the guard, whose identity has not yet been released to the public. Just before the staff made it back to Israel, Netanyahu also spoke with the King of Jordan, who is demanding Israel find an immediate solution to the ongoing crisis on the Temple Mount. Now, Aaron, it also looks like Jordan has officially finished its investiga investigation into the mm -hmm. shooting attack uh, that took place at the Israeli embassy in Amman. And they're claiming that the whole incident was actually caused uh, by an argument over a delay in delivering furniture. Now, is that true? So according to uh, Jordan's public security directorate, the entire incident did start with an altercation where uh, Muhammad al juwada the 17-year-old assailant, and another worker came into the security guard's apartment on the embassy compound, um, and the uh, embassy landlord was present as well. They got into an altercation about, about uh, the fact that the workers had arrived late, wow. which somehow resulted in al juwada stabbing the guard in the back with, with his screwdriver. The response was to shoot him, and in the crossfire, the uh, landlord who, uh, who we now know is Dr. Bashar Kamel uh, Hamarna, an orthopedic surgeon, was unfortunately also shot and succumbed to his wounds in the hospital later. Interesting, but this investigation has, has now ended. It has ended and they have concluded on behalf of, uh, of the Israeli guard that it was self-defense, yeah. Interesting. All right, well, 
Now, joining Aaron and I in the studio to go further into the details of this incident with Jordan is the former head of the Mossad and former Labor Party Knesset member, Major General Dani Yatom. Now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's begin. You know, I, I think the first question is regarding the metal detectors. Was it a wise move for Israel to remove these metal detectors? Um, and, you know, obviously, like we said, there are reports claiming that this happened as a, as a result of uh, discussions with the Jordanian government to get the injured Israeli guard back to Israel. Yes, even though the Israeli government uh, does not uh, admit that there is a connection between solving the crisis in Jordan, the shooting and uh, the stabbing before the shooting, and the crisis around the Temple Mount, I think that there is a connection. And I think that it was a formula, like a, pe a, package, a package deal, while uh, the Jordanians will allow the security men that previously they demanded to inquire to leave uh, Jordan to Israel. And a few hours later, the Israeli cabinet uh, dis will decide uh, to remove the metal uh, detector gates and this is what happened. I think that there is a connection. Now, you know, we're hearing ministers here already speak out against the move. Do you think that it was wise for it to have taken place in the first place? Look, it is uh, not that simple to assess the situation, and it is not that simple at all to foresee what are going to be the implications mm -hmm. of such a move. But I think that the cabinet in the first place and to listen more carefully to the Shabak, to the Israeli security uh, service or organization, the one who is responsible to, uh, to follow, so to speak, uh, the Palestinians. Because uh, this organization is the one with the expertise to know better than anybody else in Israel. What might be the response of the uh, Palestinians and some, Arab, uh, some other Arab or Muslim uh, people? And as far as I understand from the free media, the open media, the recommendation in the first place, both by the Israeli Defense Forces and by the Israeli security organization, the, the recommendation was not to install not to deploy those gates right. because the they, they, they foresaw that, that what this happened is going later to take place. Right. Would, would, would occur. Now, so, now Aaron, we have yeah. about a minute and a half. So movie, yeah, so I, wanna, I wanted to touch upon the 1994 treaty really quickly. Is this putting a more stress than normal between an already somewhat fragile peace between Israel and Jordan, or, or is it mostly unaffected? No, I think, I think that uh, for Israel it is uh, very, very important, not only for Jordan, people are mistaken. It is also important to Israel to preserve the peace with Jordan and with uh, Egypt. Does Jordan understand that? And Jordan no doubt understands mm -hmm. it. And the Jordanians uh, fully understand that uh, they need the peace, uh, maybe even more than Israel needs it. But I say that we need it, at least as the Jordanians need it, because it is a strategic cornerstone in our strategic situation and also in the strategic situation of the, of the Jordanians. So we have 10 seconds left in our interview, but can, do you think that there is, go there, there is going to be an impact a negative impact on Jordanian and Israeli re relations? No, I don't as a think so. I think that okay, this the crisis is solved. No. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Dani Atom. All right. Shin Bet and IDF forces have just arrested the mother of the terrorist who killed three Israelis over dinner at the Halamish settlement last Friday. The woman Ibitsam Alabed is now being charged for aggravated incitement and repeated calls for more violence against Jews. In a widely circulated video on social media, the 19-year-old terrorist Omar Alabed's mother can be seen praising her son's actions, even going so far as to say she was proud of him. A few days later, their family invited guests to their home in the West Bank village of Kobal, and as customary, mom proceeded to hand out sweets to the room as she, quote, called for attacks on Jews. That's according to the Israeli military. 
The suspect and her husband, Abd al-Jalil al-Abid, spoke to Israeli press that same day, defending their son's actions and placing full blame for the attack squarely on the Israeli occupation. He didn't injure children, the father argued to reporters, claiming their son, quote, sent them away so they wouldn't get hurt. On Tuesday morning, in a joint effort between the Shin Bet border police and the IDF, 26 Palestinian suspects were arrested across the West Bank on suspicion of terror-related activities. That included the arrest of al -Abed's mother for her alleged incitement of violence. Omar al -Abed is now receiving treatment in an Israeli hospital for wounds sustained after he was neutralized during the Halamish settlement attack. Nadia Murad was 21 when she was abducted by the Islamic State from her village in 2014. She was one of thousands of Yazidi women sold into sex slavery, but yesterday Nadia took center stage at the Knesset during her first ever visit to Israel, and she bravely appealed to Israeli leaders for official recognition of the genocide of her Yazidi people. With a full and heavy heart, Nadia recounted her tragic story to the Knesset audience in Jerusalem. The Yazidis are a religious minority targeted as non-believers by the Islamic State. Nadia is one of 5,200 Yazidis whose life was completely destroyed on the day of her abduction. That was three years ago when the Islamic State overtook her village along with much of northern Iraq. In the terrible moments before Nadia's capture, she witnessed the destruction of her village, the massacring of its Yazidi men, and the murder of her six brothers. And though this pain will always be with her, Nadia was a sight to see yesterday, proudly addressing Israel's leaders with a simple plea for Israel to officially recognize a crime of the Islamic State against her people as a genocide. The Jews and the Yazidi share a common history of genocide that has shaped the identity of our peoples, she said through an interpreter. But we must transform our pain into action. Nadia has been working with the nonprofit Israeli organization IsraAid, which she calls, quote, more functional than many governments. And her message is capturing global attention. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 2016, and last year, recognition of the Yazidi genocide was approved by British, Canadian, Scottish, and American governments. Israeli Knesset member Ksenia Svetlova from the Zionist Union Party will bring a bill recognizing the genocide to a vote in the Knesset this November. Not much captures the American imagination like counterterrorism, and for some tourists who are burned out on playing Counter-Strike and watching 24, there's only one way to get their fix. Visiting an Israeli security training camp in the West Bank. The operator of the camp says that it's not just for kicks, it's also a valuable lesson into the reality of life in a fraught region. It costs $115 to enter the boot camp, which is located in the Gush Etzion settlement block. There, tourists receive training from IDF Reserve Colonel Sharon Gat on what to do in the event of a terrorist attack. They watch Israeli commandos use Krav Maga to take down attackers and even go through a simulated open-air market to see the difficulty of spotting terrorists. It's like a video game come to life for couch-locked Americans. Oh, I don't have a weapon on me, so wherever I go, uh, there's nothing really that I could do other than uh, look for a place to run to. But it's an understanding and an appreciation of those in the security industry, whether it's the soldiers or the police officers or those in private security, of what they face and in some parts of the world what they face on a daily basis. The training camp has received criticism from Palestinians and left-wing Israeli activists, with Peace Now saying it's an unseemly way of making money from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That probably won't stem the tide of tourists, though they get a chance to experience something they only see on TV back home. Some visitors and Gat himself say it provides them with a better perspective on the reality of Israel's security situation. We explain them what it means to be living in Israel, what the IDF is all about, what the values of the, of the IDF are about, and we show them the real life in Israel, meaning life in Israel can be beautiful, this country is a beautiful country, but we're living with terror, and we're living in, in a combat region, and you have to know how to live in, a, in such a region. Packaging. Everybody likes their new purchase to look nice and shiny, but most of us don't think of the impact that very packaging could have on the environment. Well, a new Israeli startup called Green Spence has found a new way to recreate the dispensers we use for items from deodorant to shaving cream so that they're more environmentally friendly. 
Joining us with this scoop is CEO Gadi Halshai. Thank you so much for joining us. I see we have all of these uh, interesting packaging products in front of us. So tell us a little bit about what these are and what you do. Okay, Greenspans was founded in order to uh, take out the gas from the aerosols. Aerosols were invented 70 years ago and ever since are operated by pressurized gas. Right. <coughs> the pressurized gas uh, generates the pressure for dispensing mm -hmm. and um, the aerosols became very popular and 15 billion uh, <coughs> aerosols are being produced every year. But this packaging is really dangerous for the environment, correct? Correct, correct. The, the pressurized uh, uh, package is dangerous. It's not environmentally friendly. And therefore, uh, we uh, developed a new product. The product is gas-free product based on an elastic sleeve that <coughs> is mounted over a bag we, Very cool. we push the product through the valve. It all inflates, as you can see here. Right. Okay? Okay. And we generate pressure just like the gas, but without gas. The meaning of that is that there is no pressure on the package. And this means that we eliminate the need for the metal cylindrical canister. So, so you can essentially make these uh, packaging out of cardboard. This is made out of cardboard Correct. and other more biodegradable Correct. materials. Any shape and any material. It could be made out of plastic. Can I use it? Yeah, or you can, can use, use it. it. It operates. Look at that. <laughs> okay, or uh, from cardboard. And I'm going to know what this is. Oh, it's a hairspray. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I have, it smells good in here now. So, so I mean, these are. This could be very beneficial to many companies. Have you started selling this product to companies? Um, well, what is the interest? Yes, we launched the product uh, in January of this year. Okay. And we started initial sales, and we are scaling up now production for the mass production uh, needs of millions of products. Beautiful. Well, it seems like you've created something that is not only going to be great for businesses, but it's also going to help our environment, which is something we clearly need to be paying attention, attention to now. I fully so, agree. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for coming in, and I'm excited to see these uh, products in store soon. Thank you very much. All right, so it looks like another soon-to-be NBA star will be making his way to Israel, and he'll be playing for Israel's most famous basketball team, Maccabi Tel Aviv. LTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with the scoop. Emmanuel? Yes, well, the Maccabi Tel Aviv Basketball Club has officially signed. Um, he was, his name is Jonah Bolden. He was drafted in the NBA 76ers. He's 21 years old, 6 foot 10, and is now signed on to the Maccabi basketball team. Now, that's amazing. I mean, I love seeing all of these international players come here. Yes. We've had uh, Mari Stoudemire, who was playing in Jerusalem. Um, but, you know, if, he, if Jonah Bolden was picked for the 76ers, then... Why is he coming here? What is he doing here? Okay, well, basically, you know, while they are figuring out their roster, currently he doesn't have a place on the roster, at least not on the starting team mm -hmm. at the 76ers, so they thought it would be a good idea for him to play abroad, and he chose Israel, which... In reality, he's 21 years old. There's nothing better than to practice your technique, you know, work with by other the teammates beach, yeah. by, the, by the beach here in Tel Aviv. Absolutely. So, and yeah. I mean, I think the most crazy thing that's, is that this team, Maccabi, um, Maccabi Tel Aviv, it's known as Israel's most successful basketball yes. team of all time. They've won six European championships, but they recently cut or released every single player on the roster except for one man, 22-year-old center Itai Segev. Um, so it's clear that the team hasn't really been performing as well as I guess they'd like it to, um, and they're really trying to reshape the situation. Right. Well, they're really trying to reshape uh, the team itself. They're really trying to diversify themselves. They recently signed on um, the first Arab-Israeli player, which we Thank talked you, about. Big deal, right. It was... Uh, Kind of an unfortunate welcoming. A little bit of an awkward but welcoming. But he's here, and they're trying to, you know, build the team up to get a few more championships. Well, I think we're all hoping that the team is going to have better performance ahead. So thank you so much for coming in, Emmanuel. Yes. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And here comes our Hebrew word of the day. This one should be particularly relevant right about now. It's ze'ah, which means sweat in Hebrew. Well, here in the punishing Israeli summer, we know a thing or two about ze'ah. I don't want to get into the gory details or anything, but let's just say even the short walk from the car to the office can be pretty oppressive in July. Whether you're on the basketball court or walking to lunch or trying to fix your air conditioner, chances are you're probably dealing with a whole lot of ze'ah. 
but like they say, no pain, no gain. Because like everything, success is a good mix of blood, zah, and tears. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast on that note. Tonight is expected to be partly cloudy with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow should again be unseasonably hot and dry with a high of 91 or 33 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.57 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.